So I've owned my Tudor Black Bay 54 for three months now, and I've got some thoughts. If there's one watch that has been talked about a lot in these past three months, it's the Tudor Black Bay 54. And it's mostly good things, but I think there's a real difference in making a video about a new watch you've never seen before, or maybe you had it in for a week, and actually owning a watch, actually wearing that watch, and it being a part of your day to day. So today we're going to be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Tudor Black Bay 54, some things I've noticed that I've not heard any reviewers talk about yet, and what I think of it now that some of the razzle dazzle has worn off. Let's get the boring stuff out of the way, looking at the specifications, if you haven't already seen a dozen other videos saying it. This watch has a case size of 37.3mm, a lug to lug of 45.8mm, a thickness of 11.9mm, and 200 meters of water resistance. On the wrist it wears kinda oversized on me, but in a cool way? Maybe? Here it is on my five and a half inch wrist and my husband's six and a half inch wrist, but he keeps telling me it's six and three quarters. It makes me so sad to say this, but my watch is probably actually perfect on him. Perfect size, perfect proportions, exactly how it's supposed to wear. A lot of people have also flagged up the thickness with me, so I know 11.9 millimeters sounds like a lot, but for a dive watch with a bezel, dome sapphire, it's really not that bad. I wouldn't say this feels too thick, and it is nowhere near as slab-sided as my Black Bay 58. Inside this watch is the Cosk certified manufacture caliber MT5400, giving you 70 hours of power reserve. Now that we got the specifications out of the way, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly that I've noticed after three months of owning and wearing this watch a lot. <laughs> I don't know if Tudor put some witchcraft magic on my Black Bay 58 or something, but I always find myself choosing it. It's such a great go anywhere, do anything watch. It has everything you could possibly want, great legibility, loom, and it's easy to wear. I describe the Black Bay 54 as the Black Bay 58 refined. It has all the best elements of the Black Bay 58, but just a few basic aesthetic improvements were made. A smaller crown, which I personally prefer, but that's subjective. Lollipop seconds hand rather than the snowflake, less slab sided with a different style of bezel grip. It has perfect proportions and it almost feels a bit weird when you're wearing it because it feels like a vintage watch. Vintage proportions with the 37 millimeters, but then with modern build quality and specifications that we come to expect. I'd actually love to see Tudor do more watches like this, like maybe with the Black Bay GMT, adding an option that's a lot smaller and almost feels like a vintage GMT. I know they won't do it, but imagine if they did. How cool would that watch be? One of the greatest things about this watch, and separates it from the Black Bay 58, is the T-Fit clasp, and it feels like such a small deal. But this is really a game changer for me. So this clasp offers five positions of micro adjustment. All you have to do is pull slightly and then you can slide the bracelet to wherever you need it. Then when you close the clasp, it's the Tudor shield. It feels like the Hans Vilsdorf Foundation has mastered all those little details that make a watch feel special. You know? Last thing I have to say about the good before we start slagging this watch off is I feel like it's a great value proposition. When you think of the specifications, the level of finishing, loom, usefulness you're getting for £3,200 on the bracelet and about £3,000 on the rubber, it's a lot of watch. Okay, on to the bad things, and I'm going to start this with something I haven't heard anyone talk about yet, but I noticed in a press piece there's a little bit of pip misalignment or the pip's not quite right. And I'm surprised Tudor quality control would send this around. So I first noticed this when Adrian Barker was reviewing this watch. Loved every second of his video, but my stupid watch geek eye for detail noticed something was off about the pip. I was zooming in on pictures and on the video and it was off. And I remember the first thing I did, because I'd already bought it at this point, was <laughs> I grabbed my loop to make sure mine was okay, because that would really, really bother me. My Black Bay 54 is fine, and so is my Black Bay 58, thank God. But this is something possibly to look out for. Maybe the one they sent Adrian was a press piece because it wasn't quite up to snuff to sell. Who knows? I don't know, but it did give me a little scare. 
Hey guys, Editing Brit here. I've just been overthinking this whole section and I just wanted to say I hope this doesn't sound in any way like I'm slagging off Adrian because I'm not. I love his content. The whole reason I know this is because I click on his video straight away. His review is wonderful. It's just that I'm surprised that Tudor would send this and it gave me a scare when I'd already had the watch. It's what I'm trying to say. Um, Adrian's video is wonderful. If you're not subscribed to him, you probably are, but if you're not, I think he's one of the best reviewers out there. It seems like such a small thing, but you know, 3,000 pounds is a lot of moolah. It's the kind of money where you shouldn't be seeing stuff like this. Next bad thing, and I think this is a great example of sometimes a watch's best traits are also its worst, is its size. I think when people hear 37 millimeters, they think, nah, that's too small, without giving it a go. And I remember even me, when this was first released, I had the same feeling. I had tried on the 36 millimeter Breitling Super Ocean, and it was a bit too small. But there are so many factors that affect the wearing experience. Lug length, bezel width, thickness, and I think a lot of people will be pleasantly surprised by how well this wears on a larger wrist. What I always say is, if you like vintage proportions, you'll love this. If you prefer more modern proportions, the Black Bay 58 or the original Black Bay are the way forward. Another potentially bad thing is, as of right now, there's only one color option, with the black and gilt. I'd love it if they added a blue into the mix like the Black Bay 58, or maybe even a red or a green if they get funky with it. Green has been doing really well for Rolex with the Hulk and the Sermit, so... I, I think that could be really popular in this model. Hey guys, Editing Brittany here. So I said that whole spiel completely forgetting that the Herod's Black Bay exists. Um, so I don't think Herod's would be having that. <laughs> okay, so the ugly. And I have two big things I want to talk about here. So one, the faux rivets. I know people really hate on these, and I get it. It doesn't bother me as much. When you're wearing it, you'll never notice the faux rivets, but it would be my preference that they weren't there. And two, this isn't really an ugly thing about the watch. It's not its fault, but it's put me in an ugly position and situation. Because I don't know what to do now with my Black Bay 58. My Black Bay 58 will forever have a special place in my heart. It was my first watch with some pretty hard hitting, beefy specifications, and it was my most worn watch. But since I got the Black Bay 54, my Black Bay 58 has not been seeing a lot of wrist time. The size, proportions, and wearing experience of the 54 just makes more sense for me. I'm not making any big decisions about the Black Bay 58 at this time. I honestly don't even think I could sell it for much because I've battered this baby. But I just don't find myself choosing it as much anymore. Who knows, maybe it'll get gifted down to one of the nephews. Whichever one says a nice thing to me first will probably get it. <laughs> Anyways, overall, three months later, I still couldn't be happier with this purchase. Nice daily wear kind of diver that doesn't cost silly money like the Submariner. Get in. If you've watched this point, you're a legend. Thank you so much. Don't forget to do all those things to feed the YouTube algorithm gods. Like, comment, subscribe. And until next time, you gorgeous, fabulous, wonderful watch nerds. Let's thank the patrons. Haha, -ha, funky mix. Yeah, thank you patrons. Friendly reminder that Gringa patrons are the best people to ever exist and they've never done anything wrong in their lives ever. And especially the Pope tier patrons. And there's a Pope tier patron, a new Pope tier patron that I haven't thanked yet. And that's Greg C. Thank you, Greg C. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all, patrons. You really keep me in business and you keep the lights on here at Gringa HQ. Yeah.